everyone, it's Ken Rakowski, and this is Metal Mentoring, where you get to meet one of the incredible guys in the, the entrepreneur space, ask them questions, learn from them, and take yourself to another level. This week's mentor is somebody who I looked up to immensely. He's somebody that's, um, well, I'll dive into it in a moment. Uh, the automotive industry has transformed because of him from uh, Cars Direct, True Car, now Fair.com. He has made the buying experience totally change. He's challenged the industry, and because of that, everyone has changed. He is a constant entrepreneur. He also has a he had an investment portfolio of tons of companies. Uh, another um, one of the first crowdfunding platforms called Shares Post, which he put together way back in like 2007. He's been ahead of his game in so many ways. He's a family guy. He's all around about being a superhero dad all the time, someone that I admire greatly, Mr. Scott Painter. Scott, great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Okay, first question, very, very simple. Why are you doing this right now? Why are you doing this? Um, when you say this, I want to make sure. I'm, I'm... On this call. What's that? On this uh, why... call. Why are you doing this? You're one of the most busiest guys I know. Why are you doing this Zoom call with us? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I get asked for a lot of um, sort of inputs to uh, help people raise money is sort of what people most come to me for. Um, I end up meeting a lot of entrepreneurs, partly because for whatever reason, they look to things that that I've done as maybe something that they want to sort of be not well taught in business school today. I don't think that you need to be able to successfully raise money or properly transferred in business school. And so I've invested a lot of my time in being able to talk to folks and make sure that if there's anything I can give in terms of either insight, wisdom, or advice, I do. So I, I spend a lot of time giving back in this way. And I've always been a friend of metal and you've been phenomenal. So here we are. So I do want to go right upon that. You said it one of the reasons, let's be honest, is because of our relationship. That's right. I want to talk about relationships, and I hear this all the time. Your network is your net worth. Talk to me about how you have, over the last several decades, grown your network so you can actually leverage it. Well, I think it goes to a bigger issue, which is integrity. At the end of the day, if your reputation is your ability to continue to do things. For me, I've had 54 incorporations in the last 28 years. I've raised billions of dollars for venture-backed startups that all start with an idea, seed investors, A-round investors, and those are all people that are within my network. And I think it's important that you not only have a track record, I mean, I've had a very, very good track record of making people money who invest with me. They understand that I am a relentless entrepreneur. And in many cases, a seed investment is really just a bet on the individual. And so it's important that you take care of your reputation. And so for me, not everything has worked, but when I have a company that either I decide to pivot from or go on to another thing, I almost always make sure that I carry the initial investment from somebody who invested in a business that's not gonna see the exit into the next venture. And by doing that, I always make sure that people who back me get a return. And that kind of integrity has really helped me to have, like, to the point where if I say I'm gonna go start something new, at this point I can send out an invitation to a very close list of friends, fellow entrepreneurs and funds that just say, it almost doesn't matter what you wanna do because we already see through pattern recognition who you are as a, a person that you have integrity and that you take care of your investors. And it's not enough to just have a big idea. The integrity of the entrepreneur is everything, and your reputation starts with how you treat those investors, not just in goods as your profession. You have to recognize that even if you beat the odds, you're still going to fail half the time. And that means you have to decide in those failures, how do you take care of people? And that has been something that I take very seriously. I make sure that everybody who invests even a little bit of money gets their return. I, I would just hung up the phone with Sandy Kleiman and Sandy just became a metal member and Sandy goes, oh, I love Scott. Uh, he's a friend of mine. How often do people say something like that? And I, Sandy probably is a friend of yours, but everyone somehow in some way says, Scott, oh, he's a friend of mine. 
Well, I see Sandy probably a half a dozen times a year. We tend to go to many of the same things. Our, we've got a lot of overlap in terms of our social and our life. And, uh, you know, I've been to Davos for many years. I've been going to uh, TED. I think I see Sandy at about half of my social calendar over the course of the year. And the things that I've chosen to do with my free time tend to be very similar to the things he chooses. And we have a lot of overlapping friends in common. I'm not referring to Sandy. I'm referring to people in general that would say, oh yeah, Scott is a friend of mine, meaning you've created a welcoming type of attitude and you're very inviting, but somehow you mitigate who is at a friend or acquaintance level. How do you do that? Well, I, you know, I, not to talk badly about anybody, but at the same time, there are people who are just not worthy of being in your social circle at all, or professional circle. And as I've gotten older, I've become very good at curating my life. And it doesn't, you don't need to be best friends with everybody. You can be friendly with a lot of people. I think at the same time, it's more important to avoid and who to really cut out of your life. And, you know, I learned this on the, on the personal side as well, right? I went through a, a really, really tough second marriage. And what I look back on is that I just didn't have the, that I should not have invited this person into my life in the way that I did. But curating your social and professional life is probably much more important than protecting who you are friendly with. Well, when you were running your other companies, you had a dashboard on all your employees. You looked at metrics on a regular basis. They were really important. Do you place metrics on relationships also? And again, I'm not trying to be binary on or off, but do you look at some type of ROI when it comes to relationships? I really don't. I think at the end of the day, if somebody violates your trust, you need to really keep them out of your day-to-day -day life. And just that ability to curate is where you ultimately end up saying no to certain things. I get a lot of people asking me for things and I've become very comfortable with being friendly enough to say, I think it's a good idea, here's some advice, but it's not something I can do at this time. And I think as you get older and you get wiser, you don't just curate who's in your life, you curate what's in your day. And for me, I found myself probably about six or seven years ago so busy that I was finding almost a third of my time was being spent doing things that had nothing to do with a productive outcome for me. Today, I'm a little bit better about that balance. I'm really good with family. I think COVID has taught us all to look inward and to be really present with our families in a way that I don't think I could have ever been before. I'm a better dad now than I've ever been because I show up every day for dinner and my kids are tuned in and they talk to me. In the same way though, I'm also very good about taking all the inbound and being very upfront with people if it's too much or it's not in my wheelhouse of expertise. I used to take a, a run at everything that came my way thinking that's how you create opportunity is just look at it, everything and put everything in motion. Today, I'm much more selective and I'm very transparent about if somebody comes to me with a great opportunity, but it's not something where I feel I can add particular expertise, I let them know. Yeah. Hey, Scott, either your kids are sucking up your bandwidth or you're on an old TRS-80 from Radio Shack. It's choppy like crazy. Um, and I'm not sure if it's you have a bunch of apps running or just the refrigerators behind you are sucking up all the Wi-Fi. Not sure, but one of them. Maybe it's the TRS-80. Okay, you know what? I'll move. How about that? <laughs> it's the it's the old Radio Shack computer. And it's a clunker to move around. <laughs> Is this a little? Okay. Is, little, Is it a little bit better? Let's see. It might be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, guys, okay. if you have a question or something with regarding Scott, please put it inside the chat. I'll make sure you're unmuted. We want to go in this direction of Scott in metal. I, I believe in three principles plus a fourth. The three principles are C, 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 and then P. The first one is uh, contacts. I believe in our community, we look at open source Rolodexing. You know, I, you got a contact? Great. Let me make an introduction. You're in the community. We want to help each other out. You have been very, very liberal when it comes to contacts, specifically with me. And I'm wondering, when you do contacts, what kind of relationship do you think that establishes with the person you're giving the contact to, plus the introduction you're making to that other person? 
Well, I, I, I really think you can only have effective contact with a limited number of people. I don't know that you can go too broadly with just keeping in touch with everybody. For me personally, I maintain close contact with about a dozen people and about six people on an almost daily basis. Outside of that, it gets a little bit diluted and you're not able to be as effective. I'm, I'm actually not very liberal with introductions though. I guess I get asked all the time for introductions to some of my more famous friends. And it got to the point where I think I think it's important that people understand that there's for me to make an inter Scott, I think it got worse. Scott, I think the connectivity got worse. Production is also Scott, a quality. Scott, yes. Scott, I, think the, I think the internet's I'm here. I think it's worse. That's why when you live at uh, Tony Stark's house in Malibu, it gets really hard to get good internet. Um, <laughs> maybe <laughs> they're they're in they're in the middle of getting my internet fixed. I'm very ah, sorry. that's what it is. Okay, we'll tolerate it. All right, so maybe okay. I've never experienced it, but you've been inc incredibly liberal with me, and maybe I just haven't asked for the, the top-notch celebrity friends that launch rockets. Number two is credit. I believe that credit is, is, is due to somebody when they do something. When they do something, I am not going to take the credit. They deserve it. It's either the team or the person that created it. How are you when it comes to credit? I think the more you give other people credit, the better off you are. There's almost nothing to be gained by claiming credit for anything because if you do something, it's pretty obvious that you're doing it. The, the idea that you need to claim credit for anything is, I think, out of balance with how it all works. Um, Quincy Jones is uh, my oldest son's godfather. He used to be my next door neighbor. And he and I once had a conversation about how you discover talent. And he told me, talent doesn't need to be discovered. Talent, if you can really sing, if you've got true talent, you will be discovered. Oh, guys. He still listens to, and he acknowledged, he's never discovered anybody by listening to a demo tape. He still does it, but he's never discovered anybody in that way. And so I think this idea that you need to be given credit for something that you do as an entrepreneur is actually a fallacy. If you do something as an entrepreneur, if you're a founder or if you're a CEO, Scott, Scott, oh no, sorry guys. Scott's internet's not the best. Scott, I mean, we literally just lost Scott, it looks like. Scott, when you come Every back. Scott, Scott, yes, sir. Internet's really gotten even worse. I'm sorry. Is there another room? Is there another spot? Are you on your phone? I, I am on my phone. Are you on T Mobile? No, I am not on T-Mobile. <laughs> Just curious. Chad, uh, John, uh, John uh, hey, 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 have him try if you would cellular like, instead of Wi-Fi. Wi we can try this again when I am, I'm at a solid internet connection. I am really sorry about this. It's, uh, it was not expected. Oh, no, no. Let's find a spot in the house. We'll, we'll, we'll go through this process. All right, so C, first one was, of course, contacts. Next was credit. And then the next one after that is cash, meaning you, you pay for things where you should be paying for it. I don't expect anything for free, better service, but paying for things. What's your thought on people paying you for things? First of all, I don't ever take equity for introduction or take a port, you know, sort of a promote on a deal. I never have. I've only made my money based on things I do and that, that I build. I never want to be given something or, or a tip, and I don't work that way. And it sort of creates a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you are holding your hand out for own stuff, I, also, I always tend to be the guy who pays the bill, too, um, to a fault. I, I don't want anybody paying for anything for me. And the last is P. 
and that's protect. How do you protect the um, syndicate or the group that you're in? How do you protect one another? Honesty, transparency. The, the number of people that come to me for a favor or access, if I'm either not going to give it or I'm not able, I'm very direct. And I give people really honest feedback about what they're working on because if I don't, they'll end up coming back and when you're in this weird place where they don't understand the truth, I'm very, very willing from having the wrong understanding about what we're doing. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. Internet, internet, internet is not our friend at all. We're going to go uh, to our first questions. Mike, uh, who, uh, by the way, had a successful exit last year, $341 million. He sold themselves to, I think it was what, Viacom maybe, Pluto TV. Mike, what is your question for Scott Painter? All right, this is a personal one that sort of hits home a little bit for me right now. Uh, I'll read it exactly as I wrote it a couple of minutes ago. If, if, if you were to speak with yourself prior to your second marriage, which for me is ending as well, what advice would you give yourself about what you're about to do? What additional criteria would you tell yourself to be looking out for or self-protections to create prior to taking the leap? And are you following this advice in your next personal journey? Okay, I want to make sure that you can hear this and that everybody who's watching really understands. Marital law and being an entrepreneur are not working well together. It's a bad idea in general to get married. It has nothing Scott, 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 wait, Scott, 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 we want to hear this. Hey, I want to try something. Do you have a landline anywhere, Scott? Scott? Oh, let's see if we can make this work a little differently. Hey, maybe he can turn off his video for a minute, Ken. Yeah, because we want to, you want to, especially you want to hear this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Scott Painter. Scott, we definitely want to hear you. Guys, we're going to figure this out real With quick. Scott. Optimism Scott. about relationships. Wait, wait, Scott. Scott, this is important. Let's try this. Or he, he's going, guys. He doesn't give up no matter what. I found at my age, Damn. I am never I hear going this. to get married. Okay, Scott. Hold on just one second, Ken. Let me see what I Okay. Yeah, I, I want you to hear that. Um, can I, I heard, can I the, tell last, you I heard the last part. <laughs> I'll just tell you guys, my second relationship, and as you know, uh, Mike, I lost a significant amount of my, my last relationship. Um, first, if you are going to go into a third, um, I, I would not get married. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm beyond that. Scott, did you come up with a solution? Because I think we might have an idea. Scott Painter. Scott, I think we totally lost. Do him. not marry. <laughs> no, I'm right here. Do, do not, do not get married. Do not get married. No. <laughs> Scott, I'm going to turn your video off for a while. So okay. let's try this. Let's see if that helps out. Okay. Our, can you, so, can so you Scott, hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. So go ahead. Talk to us a little more about what you were saying. Yeah, so first of all, marital law and being an entrepreneur, a creator of a thing, it doesn't work. It's a horrible idea. Yeah. I would suggest you find somebody who loves you for you and is willing to intellectually understand that idea. I think the, the notion of getting married does have a game plan if you really want to you know, survive it. The problem is that Marital law only allows you to protect assets you already have. Most of us are building and we're ascending. The problem with marital law is that even if you get married and have a prenup protecting your house, let's say, but then you go out and create a new fortune, that is compensatory and that is part of the marital estate. Unless you have a postnup 
prenuptial agreement in in addition to a prenuptial agreement. It's not very romantic. No. I th the better play is to actually be in love, prioritize all the things that we find important about why we marry, find that, but why bring the state of California or whatever state you live in into your relationship? Stay away from a marriage agreement. It's just a trap. Yeah. Let, yeah. let's, let's continue a little more with uh, Mike's question. That is, uh, Mike, like I said, had a very successful exit on his last company, $341 million. Um, as he goes through this, Scott, what advice do you give someone that's going through child support? You know, it's a child uh, custody and uh, separation of assets. Well, there's three th things in a modern divorce. There's custody of the kids, there's support, and then there's division of assets. I think that those three things have to be handled in priority where you protect the children. So custody is number one. Um, as a father, I've had, and in both cases, I fought for, for my kids as much as I could. Um, I think that that's also a way to align all of the kids were okay. Ken, did you get all that? We're getting some of it, Scott. Hey, Scott, do you have a landline? I have a regular cell line. You want to just call me on my cell? Um, I, I need to get a phone number. Shoot, I don't know if I have a phone number. Hold on. I'm doing one thing here. Okay, which one is it? What's the password? Password? I don't have a password. Nope, I'm doing it on my end. Oh, Scott's getting on, guys. He's making it happen, guys. It's all good that you're here. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, guys, I do want to remind you why Scott's getting that all set up at 5 o'clock today. Uh, William Quigley is going to go through the process of uh, diving into some crypto. If you want to invest, uh, make sure you have a Coinbase account to set that up. And he's going to show us. Uh, if you enable my video, I think you can see me now. Let's see it. Uh, let me get your video going. You ready, Scott? Here we go. I'm so excited. And let's see Mr. Painter. Take it away, Scott. Can you uh, hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, there you go, neighbors, Wi-Fi. Uh. <laughs> all right. Well, first of all, congratulations on the exit. Um, you're you're trying to diffuse diffuse a bomb that's already gone off. It sounds like um, so it's a bit of a problem. Um, offline, if you want to have a conversation about this, I've got lots of advice. I've just navigated this a couple of times. Um, there are ways to protect yourself, but at the end of the day. You're in a negotiation with somebody who's protected by law. What state are you in? Uh, I'm, I'm in California, and not to air too much of my dirty laundry, but she's already dragged me through the mud with false accusations and all of this nonsense. So um, maybe I will take you up on the offer to get some advice offline. It's uh, anything that you could have imagined she could do, she's already done. And I'm um, hoping that in two weeks we have a hearing um, that focuses primarily on custody, like you're saying, the kids first, and then everything else. But um, I don't want to bore everyone else who's still optimistically looking no, at by love. The way, and Michael, it's, it, it's even better than that, because Scott's second marriage, he was defended by his wife from the first marriage. No, no, I wasn't defended. <laughs> she, was, she was definitely willing to do anything to help me. She, she bought me a boat in the middle of my second divorce because she hated my first wife so much. Uh, but what did your first wife do professionally? My first wife was a lawyer. What kind um, of lawyer? Well, she was a corporate lawyer and um, she, she went to West Point. She was my squad leader at West Point. So, oh my God. total badass. But look, I've seen it all too. Look, I, I've had all the, I, I actually was accused of certain things that in court I had to then just say, if those things are true, I'm a horrible person. Let's go ahead and do a drug test. And they ended up taking a hair follicle sample right there. Sheriff waited for somebody to come from the drug testing company. The judge said, 
if that drug test comes back that you're negative for using X, Y, and Z, everything she said is a lie and everything you say is honest and you'll have full custody of your children. Wow. Wait, and you got it? I, I, ended, up, I ended up getting full custody of my daughters for two years. Oh, that's um, wonderful. Which, by the way, while it seems like a victory, is a horrible thing for my daughters. Right. And it also creates such a toxic re residue that you almost have no workable relationship with that person. So you got to be careful about sort of what you win and what, I mean, I, I went all in. I mean, I went to the mattresses to get what I got and it ended up costing me almost $10 million in after-tax money to fight my second marriage and get my way through that divorce. That's $10 million that my kids will never have, that she will never have. That's a waste of money. I mean, that's almost 22 million pre-tax. It's crazy. Um, and it makes no sense. Um, and she doesn't even have to have smart lawyers. That's what I mean by when right. you enter that contract in a state like California, you are putting yourself at such a massive disadvantage. Um, you know, it, it never made sense to me, this whole idea of a baby mama until now. But I would say that if you're going to be an, if you're going to be an entrepreneur or you're going to be creating value during the term of your marriage, there is no way to protect your assets that you don't yet have. Yeah. So you got to be very, very careful about how you, that you can structure it. I mean, I, we could write a book on this stuff and I'm happy to tell you what I've learned based on the situation you find yourself in now. But for those of you that are listening to this, don't get married. And if you do, there is a really gnarly playbook that you have to sort of protect yourself with. It's very not romantic. No, it's not. But once you get past that, it's all great. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's yeah, question you. or idea. I, 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 think you, I think you want to be focused on exchanging the term marry with the term love. I think we all love love. I think you want to be in love. You want to find a partner. You want to be supported. You want all the things that the word marriage implies without any of the legal liability that it, that it brings you. Well, I also think Mike is going to go through another situation, Scott, which I know you went through, and that is once he's divorced and he starts dating again, all the, um, the expensive women come out to play. Well, there's phases, right? So I've been divorced for four years. You go through the model phase, yeah. then you go through the divorcee phase, then you go through the single mom phase. <laughs> all of them are fun and totally different. Um, where, where I think I've ended up is I'm looking for, for women that are kind. Um, yeah. And it turns out they're out there, but the ability to have that kind of restraint is tough in a city like Los Angeles. Um, but they all know who you are. They, I mean, you, you're, you're definitely a target. And as long as you're aware of what's, being, what's going on around you, it's fine. It can be a lot of fun. But, you know, you just got to have a lot of restraint. Uh, you cannot get sucked back into another marriage. I, mm -hmm. I ended up in my first divorce getting married within months. It was the dumbest thing possible. I was so head over heels and you know i ended up getting myself into a completely codependent relationship and i ended up exposing myself in a way that i've been paying for ever since yeah so we'll dive in this i'll exchange contact details with you mike yep. and scott thank i really you. appreciate that appreciate it thank you let, let, let's dive a little into you being a warrior because you just talked about your relationship and how you threw everything into it to defend yourself yeah your relationships needed to be defended often. Your car companies, your companies went after the status quo. It went after a, 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 a process that was there for 50, 60 years prior to you getting in there. So you, of course, have always been on this uh, defensive side. Well, I think, I think it's important to recognize that when they use the term visionary, it, it really is being um, applied to something where somebody has a vision that other people don't see. So if you have a particular point of view and you're trying to solve a problem, and that's where all businesses should start, 
good entrepreneurs, great entrepreneurs, great companies solve a particular problem. And if you have a solution, you need to realize that you're going to have resistance. Any disruption is about changing behavior. So for example, one of the things that I said on the metal call the other day was that COVID has completely and radically changed behavior. That, re that represents a timing opportunity. If you are in a business posture to benefit from that change of behavior in my business, we're all gonna buy cars digitally because we just don't wanna go into a car dealership, not because we don't like the salesman. That used to be my argument. Millennials don't wanna go into a high friction situation with a car dealer. Now it's, I'm not even for my own health gonna go face to face with another human. That is a game changer. All of a sudden in an instant, an entire industry has changed their point of view about something that makes what I do entirely possible. That's a really important timing thing to recognize, but I, I'm not really daunted by the idea that a big idea is gonna be disruptive and create drama. Um, I think the way you go about it as I'm older now, when I first started TrueCar, we were belligerent. True car is a bit of an indictment. It basically is pointing a finger at a car dealer saying, you're lying, we know you're lying, and we're calling you out. Fair was a very inclusive thing saying, our dealers are fair, you're fair, we changed the business model. So it wasn't a requirement that we had a bad guy in the equation in order to make fair a great thing. Fairness is much more about avoiding a bad or unfair circumstance. A three-year-old knows what's not fair. And so I think the, the truth issue was a very self-righteous thing that probably was more about where I was at in my life than anything else, but it was way too much unnecessary drama. Um, I, I much more prefer the fact that, you know, with FAIR, we didn't have any dealers hating what we were doing. They, they embraced it and it created a much faster build. I mean, FAIR got to almost a half a billion dollars in run rate revenue in less than a thousand days. That's a remarkable business milestone. It took us almost a decade to get to that pace at TrueCar. So it's a very different thing. Let's uh, take questions again. You've got a question, please put it inside the chat. Michael, I'm trying to unmute you. You have a question for Scott. So Michael, if you can unmute yourself, I'm trying to request, come on, do that. Scott Painter is joining us. We have him for a few more minutes, so make sure you get your questions in there. Michael, if I can't unmute you, I am going to go over to uh, Jerry. Jerry, uh, Jerry, go ahead. I'm trying to unmute you, Jerry. What's your question for Scott Painter? Go for it. Hey, Scott. Hey, Scott. Thanks so much for being here today. I really enjoyed your uh, segment there on Metal there a week or so ago. Uh, can you tell us about some of your biggest fails, failures, and then how you kind of overcame them and moved on? If you've had so many companies, I'd love to hear some. Well, I, you know, I think I've failed at just about everything. So it, it really depends right. on whether to be failure. I mean, at the end of the day, I've now resigned from three very big companies that I founded, Cars Direct, True Car, and Fair. A lot of right. people who don't know me would say, is it a failure or, you know, how does it feel to have failed at that thing? What I do, is I look at what I have accomplished. I'm a founder and a creator. I do what maybe a half a dozen other humans on the planet can do. I take an idea and I produce the whole movie. I raise the money, I put together the founding team, I come up with the product roadmap. And what I don't do is then try to operate these businesses at scale and I'm really not looking to add to my resume before I die, great operator. And so, in some eyes, the reason why I am irrepressible is because I don't acknowledge any kind of failure. I think of what I have done all as an amazing success, yet I would say it'd probably be 50-50, according to most people, have I failed at this stuff? And how do you just pick yourself up and just keep going? For me, my self-worth, my self-image, I understand what I've accomplished and I understand the unique thing that I do. I've raised literally billions of dollars of venture capital money to go and make something real that didn't exist before. And that's my contribution. What I'm getting better at 
is sort of how do I transition others into these businesses successfully without a lot of drama. But at the end of the day, I don't mope about what I've done. For me, when I um, resigned from being the CEO at FAIR, I mean, within days, I was thinking about what I'm going to be doing next and starting another company and going right back at it. And if the problem that I've identified isn't solved yet, that's probably a bigger concern for me. The thing we set out to do at TrueCar was to make pricing transparent. Today, it would be literally inconceivable for a car shopper, a first-time car shopper or a super cagey old veteran car shopper to not use the internet to get transparent information about what a car is worth. So we've changed how a thing is done. And to me, that's the definition of success. In the case of FAIR, that business has a lot of potential still ahead of it. And whether or not that company survives or not is for the most part out of my hands. I can do what I can as a board member to guide it. But really my belief is that there is still a lot of work left to be done in making and buying a car easier and more digital. I'm gonna go back and do those things that I do. So far guys, we've talked about okay, relationships Ken. when it comes to our business and our personal. We've talked about marriage and protecting your assets. Failure, which I think is fantastic. Remember, Scott is one of those rarities that shares his wisdom. And Scott, you do admire Richard Branson. I know that's somebody that you, you look up to. He seems to do such a good job to brainstorm an idea or find something and then find management around that. So why, why does he make it look almost like it's effortless for him to do that? Well, because he's not doing the things that he's not genius at. I, I, you know, I, I've gotten to know Richard actually quite well. And Richard doesn't try to do the things outside of convening and asking questions. He is phenomenal, phenomenal at creating space for change. He asks the big, the big questions about what's possible, almost to spark other entrepreneurs like me to then take that and run with it. He does not have to be the loudest voice in the room. I have watched him time and time again come to the table around a topic that you would almost think is synonymous with him, space travel or space tourism. And he'll walk into the room, he'll listen, he'll ask a question that reveals he is not wanting to be in control of the outcome. And he realizes very calmly what he brings to the table is validation on an idea or a project if and when it becomes worthy of his validation. And he's not sitting back solving the world's problems. I mean, take a guy like Elon, very different approach. Elon likes to solve the problem and he has a very binary view of how a thing should work, not nearly as collaborative, but Branson is a unique kind of leader in that he is not about trying to get you to believe what he believes. He's trying to create space for you to innovate and create, and he wants to collaborate. That's but it's actually so interesting. You, you, mix, you look at two different ones. They're almost generational, where Branson is the entrepreneur of maybe our generation a little older, and then Elon is that younger generation's entrepreneur. You know, he's, he's out to just be cool. He's... he's he doesn't have filters on. He goes after things. He's what the younger group inspired to be. You know, it's interesting. I think they're just, as, as human beings, they couldn't be more different. Yeah. They, they're, they're just not even comparable in terms of how they look at life, what they think matters. Um, you know, Elon's very aware of how much time he has and what can be achieved. And he has a very clear sense of what's possible based on logic and sort of this first principles approach to if this, then that. That's not at all how Branson sees it. Branson is much more about using his time on planet to fulfill a lot of his curiosity. Uh. He, he's on a mission to discover, and it's a very different thing. Elon's on a, a mission to achieve. Yeah, it's fascinating. Let's go to Michael. Michael, you are unmuted now. What is your question, your statement to Scott? 
Yeah, so Scott, I'm advising two automotive startups. One is a 10-minute tire change solution using robots, all four tires, including jacking up the vehicle. That's a B2C and a B2B in the reconditioning space when you talk about a Mannheim. And then um, I'm also working on a five-minute trade-in uh, of your car, touchless, in your driveway. Um, so I'm advising two entrepreneurs on the tire changing startup. We're looking at taking advantage of the COVID era to acquire small shops around the country to, to penetrate and prove out the capabilities of the systems. And I was wondering if you had any advice on how to create a subsidiary within an existing startup, whether you credit, create a separate Delaware C Corp or, or how, you, how we could structure that different ways. And then also how we could um, fund that to acquire these shops, many of which probably are, are break-even assets or maybe even money makers once COVID lifts. But unfortunately for some of them, the last few months have taken them into a cash flow position where, where they want to just either retire or they, they want to turn the shop over to someone else. So I was curious if that was in your wheelhouse and if you, you had thoughts based on all the, the work you've done. You, you asked so many questions all bundled into that. Um, that. I mean, you got a lot going on in there. I think that businesses generally fall into one of two categories. They're either representing a lot of potential or they perform really well. To the extent that the robot can do a certain amount of throughput, the really, the really interesting question is whether or not that is a debt financed business or whether that is an equity finance business. Equity is more expensive and equity wants a bigger return. I think that with respect to starting companies and being earlier stage, equity is very efficient because people are buying into the big idea and they give you a lot of credit for things you haven't yet done. To the extent that a business becomes much more operational, you're gonna be really forced to look at the performance and the trajectory of that business and how it's going to be working. I don't know enough about the, uh, the examples that you gave, but I, I do think that what you've sort of posited introduces the possibility that you finance the business other than through equity. And in that case, it's about financing the cost of the robots and understanding down to a really clear formula how those robots generate throughput and how that throughput really becomes a cost of goods in your business and how you can generate a profit. If the, if the business model in that business is a positive one, it's just about finding the right partners and replicating and repeating. I think that, you know, the, depending on how early that is, you may be only selling equity to somebody who buys into the big idea. I'd, happy, I'd be happy to talk to you and hear more, but I'd have to know a little bit more to give you specifically a, a you know, my, my point of view on what to do exactly. Michael, send me your contact details uh, and I'll make sure Scott gets a hold of you. Let's go to Travis. Travis, what's your question for Scott? Hey, Scott. Uh, thoughts on just the car sharing industry? I know the, the sharing industry in general is taking a hit because of COVID and it's probably going to probably persist for another six to 12 months of just, uh, just fear of using assets that have been used by someone else. But I, I see like Lyft and Uber and Audi have hung around long enough to see the market viability that it's like a, you know, 10, 10 to a hundred billion dollar industry, the shareables industry. How do you see that over something or even a population that still can't even do an ownership model like fair? Do you still see a viability for car sharing? Well, so uh, it's really important to get our lexicon right. Um, car sharing is very different than ride hailing. So are you asking about what's the future of ride hailing or are you asking about car sharing as a, a car specific sharing thing? specifically, not ride hailing. Okay, I think car sharing isn't a real thing. Um, it turns out that you know a lot of people um, are getting into that business, and whether you look at you know Get Around or Turo or some of these other car sharing platforms, I think they're an interesting phenomenon. But I don't think your car is like your uh, house, and uh, you know this idea of having Airbnb for cars. While it sounds catchy and it certainly is interesting, it's not a really big business, and I don't think it's consistent with how we use transportation and mobility. I don't think this idea of allowing somebody to have your car part-time jives for me. I, and I've had this argument all the way up the road at SoftBank and saying, I just don't think car sharing in the United States works except for at the very, very low end where you can't afford anything. And in that case, car sharing only works if you have a corporate fleet that can be shared out on a part-time basis. It's basically short-term rental. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I'll just ask you, would you like to lend your car out to somebody for four or five hours for 50, 60 bucks? Maybe if you're a kid living in a dorm room and 50 or 60 bucks is really going to change your world. But at the end of the day, 
The cost per seat mile of getting a car loan is about 20 cents. The cost of a ride hail mile is closer to $2. So it's not a rational decision to share your car. Most people, the phenomenon of Turo, for example, they wanna have five or six cool ass cars and the only way to do it is to get these cars rolling and generating income. And so what you have is a bunch of these power owners who end up having sort of the cars of their dreams and they're living well beyond their means because they're generating revenue. It's a very, very weird thing. And I think the idea of getting to an airport and have somebody personally driving up in their own car and dropping it off for you is bananas. I just, I, I, don't, I just don't think that's how we relate to cars. Cars not only symbolize freedom and the ability to go when you want, where you want, but a car is also a security issue. You can put your child safety seat in it. If you've got kids, you can put your shit in it. You can lock it. You take it places. And it is a rolling safety deposit box. Um, this idea that I'm going to clean out my car every day, people sort of move into their car a little bit more than I think we give them credit for. I mean, my car has tons of shit. If I had to just let my brother borrow my car, I, I mean, it's a whole rigmarole to go out and move out of one of my cars. So I like that you use rigmarole. Let's go to Dave Winston. Dave. Hey, Scott, on Saturday, you described being in an industry that the pandemic had finally broken the resistance to change. And I guess I'm looking at you to sort of walk through, how do you approach identifying the impact of disruption, disruption on an industry you're involved in? In other words, how, how did you actually walk through the process of saying, here's the disruption, here are the things that are occurring, what's this impact, and therefore, what do I do next as a result of that? Well, I've spent most of my adult life trying to convince the industry to embrace digital transactions so that you can buy the car you want at the right price, have it delivered to your driveway or wherever you want, wherever, whenever you want, with no confrontation, transparent pricing, a very simple menu-driven, totally digital experience. I, I've been trying to build that. There's a lot of resistance to what I've been doing, whether it's at True Car or at Fair or at Cars Direct. I have had to be in the business of changing the industry's hearts and minds to get people to vote with their wallet, their participation as partners to do this stuff. So I have been out there on the front line and I see the resistance every day and I've had to partner with the right folks and get money from the right folks. But this has been where I've been, you know, spending my adult time developing solutions. And then all of a sudden, the very people that have said, no, that'll never happen or I'll never do it. Within a month of the quarantine taking effect said, oh, we're gonna have to go ahead and enable a completely digital process because people aren't gonna be allowed to come into the dealership anymore. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? I've been telling you that for 20 years. And <laughs> so for me, already where they need to be, it wasn't hard for me to recognize it for my particular industry, but you can take that example and you can apply it to anything. You can just look at uh, an industry where you as an entrepreneur are trying to innovate or solve problems and just say, does the change in behavior that is resulting from COVID benefit what I've been trying to do and build or hurt it? I do think that there's a general axiom in technology development. Everything will evolve towards transparency and simplicity and savings. That's it. Those things are true. And what COVID is, just in my business, accelerating that and removing resistance because nobody is arguing right now that people want to do it digitally. That's, That's it. amazing. Let, let's go to, uh, we, have, we have one, uh, he's from Barcelona. I'm not sure if that's a big deal to you, but he's also a freaking race car driver. Let's bring him up. What's your question for Scott? Hey, Scott, uh, finally uh, able to meet you. I'm, I'm an IndyCar driver. I raced IndyCars for 20 years, um, Oriol Serbia, against one of your, your cars, your teams. Um, I'm actually the responsible of why that team moved to Formula E. Um, I ended up, I was partners in that team. I ended up, not to speak badly, as, as we said, but I ended up in a, in a similar place as you ended up with that individual. Long story short, um, since then, I'm heavily involved in a, in a technology company uh, that has a patented technology, we call it a video transaction engine, allows to complete a transaction within the video. Now, we're having big conversations with media companies, but because of my past, I have re great relationships with uh, car manufacturers. And I keep thinking, what is the 
how am I going to approach it, right? How am I going to touch that industry? And I have one minute with you, so I just want to see where, it, where your brain goes. But originally, I thought, is this going to be like late generation? Because I know dealerships, you know, something like that. But it's not enough. I don't see it. So did I say that? It so let me, let me just make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. So this video technology is already capable of helping to make a digital purchase of a car? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I don't know if anyone would buy a, a, a car from a video, right? It, that's a big, that's a big uh, uh, item, I think. I, I think in the future, we certainly will. Um, if you ever want to know what's possible in the future, ask, what would Captain Kirk from Star Trek do? Um, Captain Kirk from Star Trek would not buy a car by going into a car dealership. He would actually ask his computer, computer, I want to buy a car, and the computer would already know how much he can afford, what his credit score is, what he needs, and the computer might say, what do you want, right? And the computer might even give him a simulation on the holodeck of what that car is going to be like for him. But by the time he gets back to planet Earth off of his mission, the car will be waiting for him at home. So uh -huh. I, I do believe that because of technology, certainly because of COVID, a video conversation around getting a car is going to be absolutely something that consumers and the industry will have to embrace. I think the bigger question relative to what you're saying, though, is do you really have the systems built to make that a very, very low friction moment? Because buying a car still is going to have to relate to all of the legal regulations that govern the sale of a car. You're going to have to manage tax, title, registration, transfer of all of those things. You're going to have to then realize that most people, because the cost of a car, don't pay cash. They have to finance that car. Is there going to be mm -hmm. a loan? Is there going to be a lease? Is it going to be a subscription? How do I get all of your information? That's not just a very easy thing to do by video. For example, the difference between just this conversation we're having and if I connected to you through an app like FAIR, when you install the FAIR app and confirm your phone number, we've got your social security number. We have a soft credit poll. We know how many cars you already have, how much loan you know, you know, balance you have outstanding. We can put an actual cash value on the VIN number of the car that you have a loan on, and we don't even have to ask you for any information. So the bigger issue about whether or not people are going to buy is, of course, they're going to buy. Whatever you can imagine is going to be the most seamless way to use technology, provided that you can get an internet connection, it's going to happen. I think building the pipes underneath that, though, to make a transaction completely low friction is the much bigger thing. I think there's much more innovation that has to be done, for example, on the fintech side around the, how you finance that car mm -hmm. than almost anything else. Because it turns out the finance, uh, financing of a car is a very complex, time-consuming, and gnarly thing. That's why when we go to a car dealer, we spend three hours in the F&I department where he says, I'm going to go get my manager, right? Yeah. I, I'd like to, uh -huh. you know, a video purchase of a call is going to require the manager to come on over. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much, gracias. Uh, let's go over to Pennsylvania, and I know, Stephen, you want to pitch. Let's, let's get this pitch going, where is that? I think you got it right there. What do you want to show Scott, and Scott, how he, sh let's see it, and let's see if it's pitchable, go for it. All right, Scott, this is for seatbelt safety. This is called the cut and go. This is the only locked on, self-enclosed, manually guided, child-proof seatbelt cutter ever invented on planet Earth. And basically how it works is when you go and you put this on your belt and you hear that click, it locks on your belt forever. You sell your car, it goes with your car. It's the only way I can guarantee that it'll absolutely be there for you when you need it the most. And you just lift this handle, you break a safety tab there, and all you do is pull it slurt and boom. It cuts your belt just like that and then you pull it back and then you expose your window breaker. And what you do is you put one of these on every single one of your belts and then you get window stickers with it too to let people know that you have the cut and go system installed in your car. Okay, that's, that's long enough. Scott, what do you think? Yeah, I think the only way to make that work is to sell it to the OEMs to be installed on the cars when they're new. That's it. That's it. Or, it's a one-off one sale otherwise, right? Or, or is it something that like a AAA would um, buy and then they would actually give it away or something like that? Maybe, but probably not. I, you know, it's funny. I, I kite surf. If you go down when you're kite surfing, your, your kite strings can kill you. Everybody who kites has one of these little cutaway knives. If they didn't give it to you when you actually got the harness and everything, 
you would never purchase one separately. I mean, it's, it's just it's just not something I think people are going to buy. It doesn't make intuitive sense to me. I think it's a cool product, but what you want to have is have that as an embedded product, have it be part of safety. It's like, you know, the idea of backup cameras, they started with having a Bluetooth backup camera that you would affix to the car. Now they're all mandatory and they're all installed. If this is really that much of a safety innovation, work hard to get it installed at the time of manufacture. There you go. A couple more questions before we end, guys. Uh, let's, let me go to one of my best friends. Edwin, what's your question for? Scott Painter. Hey, Scott. Um, thanks for doing this. Uh, so robo taxis are coming, right? So uh, I know you're friends with Elon. And this is an opportunity for people who own Model 3s or any Tesla. When they go out to go on vacation, they can send their car out. It will make money for them. Uh, the car will become an asset. What is that going to do for the industry itself? Well, what you're talking about is a long ways away. Um, and I know that that's controversial. Elon has says it's, you know, next year. Um, the reality is there's much more going on about the robo-taxi fleet and how that's going to get deployed. You know, in order for Tesla, for example, have a robo taxi fleet they first have to have a robo taxi service and they haven't installed that yet so the betas there's two challenges for tesla and in, in launching robo fleet one they got to build a business and right now that's a duopoly between lyft and uber in the u.s they have to break into that and that's not necessarily a guarantee or a layup they definitely have the the, the vehicles but also keep in mind that what tesla is doing from a, a robo taxi point of view is not level five autonomy yet they have, I mean, the way I think of a Tesla is it's, it's a car with a big brain, but it doesn't have good eyesight. Um, LIDAR, which is radar, is eyes, and it tells you something's coming and time to break the car. Elon is solving a lot of that through software and a bigger brain. And that's why it's so important that his cars have a big processing chip is because they are building modeling software to understand and sense the world around them. But ultimately, one way to sort of jump the shark on autonomy is to have pre-wired grids that are using sensors that are outside of the car in some of these areas to feed information into cars like Tesla's. All of those things are in the, in the works. But what you're going to see initially before you get to a robo-taxi fleet is you know, automated delivery in very specific geographies where you can control how that car operates. Think of it almost like Autotopia at Disneyland. Those cars are on a, a track. Mm -hmm. We're gonna create digital tracks and that's where they're gonna get deployed first. And you're gonna probably go to Las Vegas and you're gonna get into a car that is effectively a robo taxi. It's just gonna go between point A and point B and it's gonna be hardwired to do that. But it's gonna have to then deal with the issues of how does it navigate real traffic, full self-driving and autonomous vehicles that can drive on non-autonomous roads or places where there's no smart grid are a while away. There's also some structural issues with getting to a place where you can use the car in your driveway during off hours. I, and by the way, if my car was in my driveway and it pulled out at midnight, I'd be like, what are you talking about? What if I want to go? Hey, let, let, let's go to Ben. Ben, last question from you, Ben. Go ahead. What's your question? Thank you, Ken. Hey, Scott. Really appreciate your what you saying before with, um, with Richard. And I, I want to see Scott's face, Ken, <laughs> when I'm asking a question. Can I see him? You can reason. only see his face when he talks. Okay, perfect. Got it. Um, so I kite as well, and I, I met with Richard Branson a couple of times on Lake Island as well. What you say earlier before about how do you know whether you are a visionary versus an operator? I know that he's an operator, he's a visionary type. I'm going through the process of fighting out by myself as well. Um, but sometimes I doubt myself if I just had the vision and I just asked the right question, how do you go about fighting the determining what the equity or any kind of participation in the company, how do you feel right about that? What is the right amount? And, and when you make the transition from, say, a visionary to actually execute the day-to-day grind, how do you make that transition? Gosh, there are uh, several questions there. First of all, I tend to think that real entrepreneurs are more vision-driven and one of the hardest things to figure out as an, as an entrepreneur is when to let go or when to shut down an idea that isn't working. It is very hard because the definition of being an entrepreneur is almost synonymous with resilience. 
And you're supposed to overcome all these objections, but unfortunately not everything is gonna work. There are fatal flaws in lots of good ideas and recognizing when you are gonna put good money after bad and knowing when to wind something down is a very important discipline. I know a lot of young entrepreneurs who have shit ideas that they are fascinated with, that they believe they're right on, and they're just not going to get there. And that's one of the things that I try to do a lot. When I talk to another fellow entrepreneur who I think is maybe a little bit younger, a little greener, and perhaps even a little delusional, I try to talk to them about, wake the fuck up. That is a, you know, have you thought about this, that, and the other? And I'll, I'll be one of the few people in their life who tell them that their baby is ugly to save them a lot of brain damage and a lot of heartache. But once you get over that, it starts to inform how you transition from being an early stage entrepreneur to being a supporter of your business as it gets later stage. I think that there are two vectors that really are important to understand. One is time. The earlier you are engaged in a company, the more it needs you. Over time, it will need you less. That almost always relates to money. I think one of the most undervalued qualities of a great entrepreneur is the ability to raise money. If you can not raise money for your early stage company, you better be a fucking amazing operator. And more importantly, if you can't raise money early stage for your vision, you're probably not a visionary. Mm. because those two things tend to be self-evident and, and very true. If, if you're good at raising money, it's probably because you know how to tell a good story. You know how to read your audience. You know how to listen. You know how to sell. That is all part of being a vision-driven entrepreneur that builds things. And if you're good at that, you're probably, probably not a great operator because you, you, you view the world in a very different way. I think, for example, one of the things that I know about myself is I'm far too optimistic to be a disciplined operator. When I tell somebody in an early stage venture that I'm gonna go do a thing, I fundamentally pathologically believe I'm gonna go do that thing. And it's only when I fail to do that will I acknowledge I can't do it. I mean, that's a really important thing. A good operator, though, has to take a fundamentally different approach. This is why a guy like Elon is so fascinating, right? He's willing to be honest about what's possible while also being open to what's possible and the potential of a thing. But he's very pragmatic. I actually tend to be not very pragmatic, and that's important for me to be able to create. If I was too pragmatic... It's, here, here's a good example. As you build a company, you tend to hire experts. You, you hire experts because you want to bring credibility to your venture. So you go hire the, the human being that is the best at a thing. And what does that human being come in and tell you the first day they arrive? Tell you, they tell you why you're wrong and why you should do it the way they suggest. So it creates an instant dilemma for you as a founder, which is, are you gonna to listen to the expert, who, the one who you're hiring, or are you gonna take somebody who's clearly more knowledgeable about a thing than you and spend your time convincing them that you're right, learn from their wisdom, but continue to direct them to a different outcome? Because quite honestly, if all the experts were always right, what room would there be to invent solutions? Damn, okay, Scott. You, you over, overdid it, you overperformed. Guys, I, I want you to understand that that is a gladiator sitting in front of you. You know, he briefly talked about his health issue that he had when it came to a stroke. He also had some other physical issues. His house burned down a year and a half ago or two years ago. Yep. He's gone through two horrible divorces. Um, he's gone through war and he's come out looking incredible. And that right there is not just an entrepreneur, but a gladiator and Scott, it's an honor to have you part of this community. Thank you so much for contributing. I am so sorry about the early Wi-Fi. <laughs> it was all good. Yeah, but you found a solution. That's what you do. You actually hijacked your neighbor's Wi-Fi. That's awesome.
Scott Painter. Everyone unmute yourself and let's all thank Scott. Come on, everyone unmute yourself and let's say thanks, Scott. Thank Scott, you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. That's fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Awesome. Thank Bye, everyone. Scott.